This is an attempt at an introduction to my general ideas. What I want to try to convey is the basic obsession or preoccupation that runs through all my work and has ever since I started writing at about the age of 19. As I look back over 50-odd books whose subjects range from mysticism to criminology, I can see that a single thread runs through all my work. The question of how man can achieve these curious moments of inner freedom, the sensation of sheer delight that G.K. Chesterton called absurd good news. The poet Yeats described the sensation in a short poem. My 50th year had come and gone. I sat a solitary man in a crowded London shop an open book and empty cup on the marble tabletop. While on the shop and street I gazed, my body of a sudden blazed, and twenty minutes more or less it seemed so great my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. Such sensations seem to occur when we relax below some threshold of tension that normally traps us in a more superficial consciousness. There's a sensation of freedom, of peace and serenity. In such moments, we also feel that our energies are more than adequate to meet any challenge. In sharp contrast, the normal consciousness, which always seems to be in a hurry, and in which we have the vaguely uncomfortable sense that our energies are never quite adequate. The feeling of absurd good news is often contradicted by its opposite, what might be called absurd bad news, a feeling that we're helpless victims of forces far stronger than we are. In these moods, it seems that all our values are illusions created by the body. There's a scene in A Farewell to Arms of Hemingway where the hero is being prepared for an operation by a nurse with whom he's in love, and he asks uh, if she'll be on duty that night after the operation, and she says, I probably will, but you won't want me. He says, yes, I will. No, you won't. You've never been operated on. You don't know how you'll be. He says, I'll be all right. But after the operation, he admits, I was sick and Catherine was right. It didn't make any difference who was on night duty. When he looks at her before the operation, he can see that she's beautiful and desirable, ergo, he'll want to make love to her after the operation. He acknowledges that he may feel sick, but he's certain that he'll simply overrule his sickness. In the event, it overrules him. The underlying suggestion is that our values, like our desires, are merely physical sensations. The same thing suggested even more chillingly in Flecker's Hassan. After the two lovers have been tortured to death because the girls refused to give herself to the caliph, the ghosts meet by the fountain in the caliph's garden. The fountain ghost tells her, as long as you remember what you've suffered, you'll stay near the house where your blood was shed. She replies, we'll remember that 10,000 years. And the ghost tells her, you've forgotten you're a spirit. The memories of the dead are thinner than their dreams. And when the wind from eternity blows, she calls to her lover, speak to me, speak to me, Rafi. And his ghost answers, Rafi. Raffi. Who was Raffi? Here Flecker sounds a note of pessimism that goes beyond the tragedy of their deaths, the suggestion that they've died for a delusion and that all men die for delusions. For me, the problem first presented itself at Christmas time as a child. That marvellous feeling of richness and excitement made it obvious that life is not difficult and boring and repetitive. Then came the new year and the return to school, and it was like waking up from a pleasant dream in an icy bedroom, and the glow of Christmas seemed an illusion. Yet, the moment the moods of happiness and freedom came back, on a day trip to the seaside or picking blackberries on an autumn afternoon, it was quite plain that there weren't some kind of delusion or wishful thinking. It was again self-evident that the world was a far bigger and more exciting place than we normally give it credit for. Now, this raised an interesting question. When you've learned to solve some puzzling problem, like how to remove a bicycle tire or extract a square root, 
The solution stays in your head permanently. You don't forget it the next day. Yet, um, in the case of this question, whether the absurd good news is a delusion or reality, the solution seems to evaporate into thin air the next day, so that it was impossible even to remember what I'd felt so happy about. I was in my early teens when I discovered that I wasn't the first person to brood on this problem. It had been encountered by whole generations of writers and artists of the 19th century, a movement we call Romanticism. The Romantics were always experiencing these strange moods of delight and relaxation in which they seemed to see the answer to all the problems of existence. And the next day, the inside had vanished, leaving them miserable and fretful. This seemed to explain the high rate of suicide and early deaths from tuberculosis among the Romantics. Here I could see the problem had taken on a slightly different form. The Romantics suspected that the truth about the world is ordinariness and triviality. That human beings are basically selfish, short-sighted, and narrow-minded little animals, and that all these attempts to convince ourselves that we can reach for the stars are a kind of game of make-believe, like children playing kings and queens. As human beings grow up, they learn to look more dignified and purposeful, but inside, every one of us is still a child whose basic interests are food, amusement, and creature comforts. And when we feel tired and discouraged, the child seems to take over again. My first book, The Outsider, was about this problem. Men who experienced moments of intense ecstasy and affirmation then found themselves dragged down by the triviality of everydayness, which is Heidegger's phrase, and the misery of unfulfillment. To such men as Van Gogh, Nietzsche, and Nijinsky, Dostoevsky, the problem presented itself in terms of Carlyle's everlasting yes versus everlasting no. Paintings like Van Gogh's Starry Night express ultimate faith in the power of life over death. All the same, he committed suicide, leaving a note saying, misery will never end. Yet, in the last pages of that book, it became clear that mystics like William Blake and Sri Ramakrishna had come altogether closer to arriving at a satisfactory solution to the problem. This is why my second book, Religion and the Rebel, which is really a second part of The Outsider, dealt mainly with saints and mystics and religious visionaries. There was, in fact, a period in my teens when I felt that my own answer might lie in this direction, entering a monastery or travelling to India to study the perennial philosophy at its source. The problem, I felt, amounted to finding something to do, a way of living that would be a direct expression of this urge to explore visionary awareness. Every way of living that I explored, from working as a farm labourer to washing dishes in restaurants, seemed to lead away from my objective, or at best to run parallel to it. It was a frustrating feeling, like trying to approach a mountain which is perfectly visible, and finding that no road seems to get you any closer. After writing Religion and the Rebel, this frustration seemed to disappear, I presume, because now I was able to devote my life to writing. I found a way of living that led straight towards my objective. This certainly increased when, in 1959, I received a letter from the American psychologist Abraham Maslow, who told me about his own discovery that all healthy people seem to have peak experiences, my moments of affirmation. Maslow believed that it was impossible to induce peak experiences at will, but I felt he was mistaken. Uh, for example, Graham Greene had done precisely that by playing Russian roulette with a loaded revolver. He said he'd read my book, The Age of Defeat, and liked my idea that much of the gloom and defeat of 20th century literature is due to what I'd called the fallacy of insignificance. Maslow said this resembled an idea of his own, which he called the Jonah complex. One day, he'd asked his students, which of you expects to achieve greatness in your chosen field? His class looked at him blankly. After a long silence, Maslow said, if not you, who then? And they began to see his point. This is the fallacy of insignificance, the certainty that you're unlucky and unimportant, the Jonah complex. The papers he enclosed looked highly technical. Their titles contained words like metamotivation, synergy, eupsychian. I glanced at them and pushed them aside. 
Some months later, I came across them again, and this time my eye was caught by the term peak experience in one of the titles, and I started to read. It was immediately clear that I'd stumbled upon something important. Maslow explained that sometime in the late 30s, he'd been struck by the thought that modern psychology is based on the study of sick people. But since there are more healthy people around than sick people, how can this psychology give a fair idea of the workings of the human mind? It struck him that it might be worthwhile to devote some of the time to the study of healthy people. Maslow writes, When I started to explore the psychology of health, I picked out the finest, healthiest people, the best specimens of mankind that I could find, and studied them to see what they were like. They were very different, in some ways startlingly different, from the average. I learned many lessons from these people, but one in particular is our concern now. I found that these individuals tended to report having had something like mystic experiences, moments of great awe, moments of the most intense happiness or even rapture, ecstasy or bliss. These moments were a pure positive happiness when all doubts, all fears, all inhibitions, all tensions, all weaknesses were left behind. Now self-consciousness was lost. All separateness and distance from the world disappeared and they felt one with the world, fused with it, really belonging to it, instead of being outside looking in. One subject said, for instance, I felt like a member of a family, not like an orphan. Perhaps most important of all, however, was the report in these experiences of the feeling that they'd really seen the ultimate truth, the essence of things, the secret of life, as if veils had been pulled aside. Alan Watts has described this feeling as, this is it, as if you'd finally got there, as if ordinary life was a striving and a strain, straining to get someplace, and this was the arrival, this was being there. Everyone knows how it feels to want something and not to know what. These mystic experiences feel like the ultimate satisfaction of vague, unsatisfied yearnings. But here, I'd already learned something new. The little that I'd ever read about mystic experiences tied them in with religion, with visions of the supernatural, and like most scientists, I'd sniffed at them in disbelief and considered it all nonsense, maybe hallucinations, maybe hysteria, almost surely pathological. But the people telling me about these experiences were not such people. They were the healthiest people. And I may add that it taught me something about the limitations of the small orthodox scientist who won't recognize as knowledge or as reality any information that doesn't already fit into the existent science. Now, the inexperiences are not religious in the ordinary sense. They're natural and can be studied naturally. They're not ineffable in the sense of being incommunicable by language. Maslow also came to believe that they're far commoner than one might expect, and that many people tend to suppress them, to ignore them, and certain people actually seem afraid of them, as if they were somehow feminine, illogical, dangerous. Maslow says, one sees such attitudes more often in engineers, in mathematicians, in analytic philosophers, in bookkeepers and accountants, and generally in obsessional people. The peak experience tends to be a kind of bubbling over of sheer delight, a moment of pure happiness. Um, for instance, um, a young mother scurrying around a kitchen and getting breakfast for her husband and young children. And the sun was streaming in, the children clean and nicely dressed were chattering as they ate. The husband was casually playing with the children and as she looked at them she was suddenly so overwhelmed with their beauty and her great love for them and her feeling of good fortune that she went into the peak experience. A young man working his way through medical school by drumming in a jazz band reported many years later that in all his drumming, he had three peaks when suddenly he felt like a great drummer and the performance was perfect. A hostess, after giving a dinner party where everything had gone perfectly and it had been a fine evening, said goodbye to her last guest, sat down in a chair, looked around at the mess and went into a peak of great happiness and exhilaration. Maslow described another typical peak experience to me later when I met him at his home in Waltham, Massachusetts. A marine had been stationed in the Pacific and hadn't seen a woman for a couple of years. When he came back to the base camp, he saw a nurse, and it suddenly struck him with a kind of shock that women are different to men. The marine had said to Maslow, we take them for granted as if they were another kind of man, but they're quite different with their soft curves and gentle natures, and he was suddenly flooded with a peak experience. Observe that in most peak experiences, 
the person suddenly becomes aware of something that he'd known about previously, but been inclined to take for granted, to discount. And this matter had always been one of my own central preoccupations. My religion and the rebel had been largely a study in the experiences of mystics, and in its autobiographical preface, I'd written about a boring office job. As soon as I grew used to it, I began to work automatically. I fought hard against this process. I'd spend the evening reading poetry or writing, and were determined that with sufficient mental effort, I could stop myself from getting bored and indifferent at work the next day. But the moment I stepped through the office door in the morning, the familiar smell and appearance would switch on the automatic pilot which controlled my actions. I was clearly aware that the problem was automatism. And in a paper I later wrote for a symposium of existential psychology, I elaborated this theory of the automatic pilot, speaking about it as the robot. I wrote, I'm writing this on an ele electric typewriter. When I learned to type, I had to do it painfully and with much nervous wear and tear. But at a certain age, a miracle occurred, and this complicated operation was learned by a useful robot whom I conceal in my subconscious mind. Now, I only have to think about what I want to say, and my robot secretary does the typing. He's really very useful. He also drives the car for me, speaks French, not very well, and occasionally gives lectures at American universities. He has one enormous disadvantage. If I discover a new symphony that moves me deeply, or a poem or a painting, this bloody robot promptly insists on getting in on the act. And when I listen to the symphony for the third time, he begins to anticipate every note. He begins to listen to it automatically and I lose all the pleasure. It's most annoying when I'm tired because then he tends to take over most of my functions without even asking me. I've even caught him making love to my wife. My dog doesn't have this trouble. Admittedly, he can't learn languages or how to type. But if I take him for a walk on the cliff, he obviously experiences every time just as if it was the first. I can tell this by the ecstatic way he bounds about. Descartes was all wrong about animals. It isn't animals who are robots, it's us. Heaven lies about us in our infancy, as Wordsworth pointed out, because the robot hasn't yet taken over. So a child experiences delightful things as more delightful and horrid things as more horrid. Time goes slower. Mechanical tasks drag because there's no robot to take over. When I asked my daughter if she meant to be a writer when she grew up, she said with horror that she got fed up before she'd written half a page of schoolwork and couldn't even imagine the tedium of writing a whole book. The robot's necessary. Without him, the wear and tear of everyday life would exhaust us within minutes. But he also acts as a filter that cuts out the freshness, the newness of everyday life. If we're to remain psychologically healthy, we must have streams of newness flowing into the mind, what J.B. Priestley calls delight or magic. In developing the robot, we've solved one enormous problem and created another. But um, there is, after all, no reason why we shouldn't solve that too. Modify the robot until he admits the necessary amount of newness while still taking over the menial tasks. Now, I was much struck by Maslow's comment on the possibility of creating peak experiences at will because his feeling was that it can't be done. He said, no, or almost entirely no. In general, we are surprised by joy, to use the title of C.S. Lewis's book on just this question. Peaks come unexpectedly. You can't count on them. And hunting them is like hunting happiness. It's best not done directly. It comes as a byproduct an epiphenomenon, for instance, of doing a fine job or a worthy task that you can identify with. Well, it seemed to me that this is only partly true, and I'll try to explain this briefly. Novelists have got to be psychologists, and I think of myself as belonging to the school known as the phenomenological movement. The philosopher Edmund Husserl noted that all psychological acts are intentional, Note what happens when you're about to tickle a child. The child begins to squirm and laugh before your hands have actually reached him. On the other hand, why doesn't it tickle when you tickle yourself? Obviously, because you know it's you. The tickling is not something physical that happens when your hands encounter flesh and make tickling motions. It seems to be 99% psychological. When the child screams with laughter, he's tickling himself, just as he might frighten himself by imagining ghosts in the dark. So the paradoxical truth is that when someone tickles you, you tickle yourself. And when you tickle yourself, you don't tickle yourself, which is why it doesn't tickle. So being tickled is a mental act, an intention, 
and so are all perceptions. I look at something as I might fire a gun at it. If I glance at my watch while I'm in conversation, I see the time, yet I don't notice what time it is. And as well as merely seeing, I have to make a mental act of grasping. Now, the world is full of all kinds of things that I can't afford to grasp or notice. If I'm absorbed in a book, I grasp its content, my mind explores it as though my thoughts were fine, thin tentacles reaching every corner of the book. But when I put the book back on the shelf, it's standing among dozens of other books, which I've also explored at some time in the past. As I look at all these books, I can't simultaneously grasp them all. From being intimate friends, they've become mere nodding acquaintances. Perhaps one or two, of which I'm very fond, mean more to me than others. But of necessity, that's got to be very few. Consider Maslow's young mother getting the breakfast. She loves her husband and children, but all the same, she's directing the beam of interest at making the coffee, buttering the toast, watching the eggs in the frying pan. So she's treating her husband and children as if they were a row of books on a shelf. Still, her energies are high. She's looking forward to an interesting day. Then, something triggers a new level of response. Perhaps it's a beam of sunlight streaming in through the window, which seems to shake her by the arm and say, Look, isn't it all wonderful? And she suddenly looks at her husband and her children as she'd look at the clock to find out the time. She becomes self-conscious of the situation, using her beam of interest to scan it, instead of to watch the coffee. And having put twice as much energy into her scanning, she experiences newness. The mental act of looking at her family and thinking, I'm lucky, is like an athlete gathering himself for a long jump, somehow concentrating his energies. Think what happens if somebody returns a book that he borrowed from me a long time ago. I look at the book with a kind of delight, as though it were a return prodigal. Perhaps I open it and read a chapter. Yet, if the book had stayed on my shelf for six months, I might not have even bothered to glance at it. The return of the books made me focus my beam of interest like an athlete gathering for a leap. When something occupies my full attention, it's very real to me. When I put the book back on the shelf, I've unrealized it to some extent. I've pushed it back into a more abstract level of reality. But I have the power to realize it again. Um, consider the mental act I make when I feel glad to see the book back. I reach out my invisible mental tentacles to it as I might reach out my hand to a friend I'm delighted to see. And I focus my beam of interest with a kind of intensity, the kind of intentness with which a sapper defuses an unexploded bomb. We do this realizing and unrealizing all the time and so automatically that we fail to notice that we're doing it. Um, it's not just happening. Like the athlete gathering himself to leap, it is a deliberate compression of the mental muscles. All this suggests to me that Maslow's mistaken to believe that peak experiences have to come without being sought. A little phenomenological analysis like the kind we've conducted here reveals that peak experiences have a structure that can be duplicated. The peak experience is the culmination of a series of mental acts, each of which can be clearly defined. The first precondition is energy, because the peak experience is essentially an overflowing of energy. This doesn't mean ordinary physical energy. Maslow points out that sick people can have peak experiences just as easily as healthy ones if the conditions are right. If you say to a child, I'll take you to the pantomime tonight if you'll tidy your bedroom. He immediately seethes with bustling energy. The normally boring act of tidying a room is performed with enthusiasm. And this is because he, figuratively, takes a deep breath. He's so determined that the tidying shall be satisfactory that he is prepared to devote attention to every square inch of the floor. And the mental act that lies behind this is a certain concentration and a summoning of energy, like calling all hands on deck. If I'm asked to do a job that bores me, I summon only a small quantity of energy, and if the job's complicated, I skimp it. If I'm determined to do it thoroughly, I place the whole of my interior army and navy on call. And in this state, a vigilance, alertness, preparedness, this is the basis of the peak experience. Now, healthy people, like Maslow's housewife, are people with a high level of preparedness.
This can be expressed in a simple image. My surplus energy is stored in my subconscious mind in the realm of the robot. It's like money that's been invested in stocks and shares. Nearer the surface of everyday consciousness, there are surplus energy tanks, energy which is ready for use, like money in my personal account at the bank. When I anticipate some emergency or some delightful event like a holiday, which I shall need energy to enjoy to the full, I transfer large quantities of ready energy up to these surface tanks, just as I might draw a large sum out of the bank before I go on holiday. Peakers are people with large quantities of energy in the ready energy tanks. Bored or miserable people are people who only keep small amounts of energy for immediate use. But it must be borne in mind that both types of people have large amounts of energy available in their deep storage tanks in the realm of the robot. It's merely a matter of transferring it to your current account. In a paper called The Need to Know and the Fear of Knowing, Maslow describes one of his crucial cases. This is what he says. Around 1938, a college girl patient presented herself complaining vaguely of insomnia, lack of appetite, disturbed menstruation, sexual frigidity and a general malaise, which soon turned into a complaint of boredom with life and an inability to enjoy anything at all. Life seemed meaningless to her. Her symptoms closely paralleled those described by Abraham Myerson in his book When Life Loses Its Zest. As she went on talking, she seemed puzzled. She graduated about a year before, and by a fantastic stroke of luck, and this was the depression, remember, she'd immediately got a job. And what a job, $50 a week. She was taking care of a whole unemployed family with the money and was the envy of all her friends. But what was the job? She worked as a sub-personnel manager in a chewing gum factory. And after some hours of talking, it became more and more clear that she felt she was wasting her life. She'd been a brilliant student of psychology, was very happy and successful in college, but her family's financial situation made it impossible for her to go on into graduate studies. She was greatly drawn to intellectual work, not altogether consciously at first, because she felt she ought to feel fortunate with her job and the money it brought her. Half-consciously, then, she saw a whole lifetime of greyness stretching out ahead of her. I suggested that she might be feeling profoundly frustrated and angry, simply because um, she wasn't being her own very intelligent self, that she wasn't using her intelligence and talent for psychology, and that this might well be the major reason for her boredom with life, and her body's boredom with the normal processes of pleasure. Any talent, any capacity, I thought, was also a motivation, a need, an impulse. With this she agreed, and I suggested she could continue her graduate studies at night after work. In brief, she was able to arrange this, and it worked well. She became more alive, more happy, more zestful, and most of her physical symptoms had disappeared at my last contact with her. It's significant that Maslow, although trained as a Freudian, didn't try to get back into the subject's childhood and find out whether she'd experienced penis envy of her brothers or desire to murder her mother and marry her father. He'd followed his instinct, his feeling that creativeness and the desire for a meaningful existence are as important as any subconscious sexual drives. Now, anybody who knows my own work will see why Maslow's approach appealed to me so much and why mine apparently appealed to Maslow. My first book, The Outsider, written when I was 23, was about people like Maslow's girl patients, men driven by an obscure creative urge that made them feel dissatisfied with everyday life, and which in some cases, T. Lawrence, for example, caused them to behave in a manner that seemed masochistic. The book sprang from my own obsession with the problem I called life failure. Auden wrote, Put the car away when life fails, what's the good of going to Wales? Eliot asks in The Rock, where is the life we have lost in living? And Shaw says about the ancients in Back to Methuselah, even at the moment of death their life does not fail them. Maslow's patient was suicidal because she was feeling she was losing her life in the process of living it. Quite clearly, we were talking about the same thing. I'd ask repeatedly in The Outsider, why does life fail? Maslow was replying, in effect, because human beings have needs and cravings that go beyond the need for security, sex, territory. He states it clearly in the preface to the Japanese edition of his Eusyche and Management, asserting that, quote, human nature has been sold short, that man has a higher nature, 
which is just as instinctoid as his lower nature, and that this higher nature includes the need for meaningful work, for responsibility, for creativeness, for being fair and just, and for doing what's worthwhile and preferring to do it well. Uh, let me outline my own approach to the problem as I explained it in subsequent correspondence with Maslow. The outsider had developed from my interest in the romantics of the 19th century, Goethe, Schiller, Novalis, Wagner, Nietzsche, Van Gogh. What fascinated me was their world rejection. It was summed up by Villiers de Lille Adams' hero Axel in the words, live, our servants can do that for us. Axel asserted that real life is always a disappointment. The heroine, Sarah, has a long speech in which she speaks about all the marvellous places they might visit now they've found the treasure. Axel replies that the cold snows of Norway sound marvellous, but when you actually get there, it's just cold and wet. L. H. Myers had made the same point with fine precision in a novel called The Near and the Far, where the young prince, Jarley, stares at a splendid sunset over the desert and reflects that there are two deserts, one that's a glory to the eye and the other that's a weariness to the feet. And if you tried rushing towards that sunset, you'd only get your shoes full of sand. It seems impossible to grasp that promise of the horizon. And it was this feeling of despair about the near and the far, the feeling that they can never be reconciled, that led to so many early deaths among the romantics, suicide, insanity, tuberculosis. Obermann, in Senoncourt's novel of that name, says that the rain depresses him, yet when the sun comes out, it strikes him as useless. And um, that's life failure. But man's achievement is to have created a world of the mind, of the intellect and imagination, which is as real in its way as any actual country on the map. Sir Karl Popper, in one of his most important papers, um, calls it the third world, or world three. The first world is the objective world of things. The second world is my inner subjective world. But, says Popper, there's a third world, the world of objective contents of thoughts. If some catastrophe destroyed all the machines and tools on this earth, but not the libraries, a new generation would slowly rebuild civilization. If the libraries were all destroyed too, there could be no re-emergence of civilization, for all our carefully stored knowledge would have gone, and man would have to start regaining it from scratch. Teilhard de Chardin calls this third world the noosphere, that is, the world of the mind, and it includes the works of Newton, Einstein, Beethoven, Tolstoy, Plato. It's the most important part of our human heritage. A cow inhabits the physical world. It's got almost no mind to speak of. Man also inhabits the physical world and has to cope with its problems, but he's built civilization because the physical world is not enough. Nothing is so boring as to be stuck in the present. Primitive man loves stories for the same reason that young children do, because they afford it an escape from the present, because they freed his memory and his imagination from mere reality. Einstein made the same point. He said, one of the strongest motives that lead men to art and science is to escape from everyday life with its painful crudity and hopeless dreariness. A finely tempered nature longs to escape from personal life into the world of objective perception and thought. And this desire may be compared to the townsman's irresistible longing to escape from his noisy, cramped surroundings into the silence of high mountains. But my central point is this. Man is still a very young creature. His remotest ancestors only date back two million years. The sharks remained unchanged for 150 million years. And although he longs for this third world as his natural home, he only catches brief glimpses of it. For, for it can only be focused by a kind of mental eye. This morning, as I cleaned my teeth in the bathroom, a fragment of Brahms drifted through my head and caused this sudden feeling of inner warmth. And the person labelled Colin Wilson ceased to matter. It was almost as if I'd floated out of my body and left him behind, as if the real I had taken up a position somewhere midway between myself and Brahms. In the same way, when I'm working well, I seem to lose my identity, identifying instead with the ideas or people I'm writing about. 
But very often, I can't even begin to focus that third world. The real world just distracts me too much and keeps my attention fixed on its banal actualities, like some idiot on a train who prevents you from reading by talking in a loud voice. All the same, this third world is a place. It's there all the time, like China or the moon. And it ought to be possible for me to go there at any time, leaving behind the boring person who's called by my name. It's fundamentally a world of pure meaning. It's true that my small personal world is also a world of meaning, but of trivial personal meaning, distorted and one-sided, a kind of worm's eye view of meaning. It's man's evolutionary destiny to become a citizen of that third world, to explore it as he might now explore Switzerland on a holiday. It's impossible to predict what will happen to human beings when that time comes for this reason. Meaning stimulates the will, fills one with a desire to reach out to new horizons. When a man in love sees the girl approaching, his heart leaps. When I hear a phrase of music that means something to me, my heart leaps. And that leap is vitality from my depths, leaping up to meet the meaning. And the more meaning I perceive, the more vitality rushes up to meet it. As his access to the world of meaning increases, man's vitality will increase towards the Superman level. That much is clear. Boredom cripples the will, and meaning stimulates it. And the peak experience is a sudden surge of meaning. The question that arises now is, how can I actually choose meaning? If Maslow's correct, I can't. I must be surprised by it. It's a byproduct of effort. Now, at this point, I was able to point out to Maslow a possibility that he'd overlooked, a concept I called the indifference threshold, or St. Neot margin. Now, this is fundamentally a recognition that crises or difficulties can often produce a sense of meaning when more pleasant stimuli have failed. Sartre remarks that he'd never felt so free as during the war when, as a member of the French resistance, he was likely to be arrested and shot at any moment. The constant danger of arrest kept him at a high level of alertness, attention. It seems a paradox that danger can make you feel free when peace and serenity fail to arouse any response. It does this by forcing you to concentrate. Maslow's girl patient became so bored with her job in the chewing gum factory that she allowed the focusing muscle to go permanently flaccid. If you allow the will to remain passive for long periods, it has the same effect as leaving your car in the garage for the winter. The batteries go flat. And when the batteries go flat, life fails. These focusing muscles must be used if we're to stay healthy, for they're the means by which the mind focuses on values, just as the eye muscles enable the eye to focus on distant objects. If we fail to use them for long periods, the result's a kind of mental short-sightedness, a gradual loss of the feeling of the reality of values, of meaning. This explains what happens if you watch television for too long or you read a very long book on a winter day until your eyes are aching. Your meaning focus relaxes as your interest flags and if you then go for a walk, everything seems oddly meaningless and dull. It just is and it doesn't arouse any response. The Greek poet Dimitrios Kapitanakis wrote in the early 40s, Well, I thought that when the war started, trying to hope for the best, It'll be horrible, but if it's so horrible as to frighten and wake up the mind, it'll be the salvation of many. Many are going to die, but those who are going to survive will have a real life with a mind awake. But I was mistaken. The war is very frightening, but it's not frightening enough. The same thought struck me when I was reading the article Camus wrote for the resistance paper Combat, when the Germans were being driven out of Paris. It's called The Night of Truth, and it's full of noble phrases. The skyline of Paris is blazing, he says, but these are the flames of freedom. Those who never despaired of themselves or of their country find their reward under this sky. The great virile brotherhood of recent years will never forsake us. Man's greatness lies in his decision to be stronger than his condition, and so on. But Simon de Beauvoir's novel, The Mandarins, begins shortly after the liberation, and Camus is one of the characters, and they drift around the night spots of Saint-Germain and drink too much and smoke too much and waste time on pointless adulteries. What had happened to the night of truth? The answer's simple. Without the danger and injustice to keep the mind alert, 
they allowed a kind of inner laziness to descend. But didn't Camus remember their feelings about a completely different kind of future? The answer is, in the real sense of the word, no. Real memory brings a sense of meanings and values with it. False memory recalls the facts, but without that inner content of meaning. It must be squarely recognized that man suffers from a very real form of amnesia. And this is not just a figure of speech, but a reality. For the meaning depends upon this power of the mind of focusing. Must we then draw the pessimistic conclusion that man needs war and injustice to prevent him from lapsing into a condition of boredom, or at least of preoccupation with trivialities? The answer, fortunately, is no. Focusing is a muscle, and it can be strengthened like any other muscle. Graham Greene, in an essay I've often quoted, describes how, in his teens, he sank into a condition of extreme boredom and depression during which life became meaningless. He tried playing Russian roulette with his brother's revolver, inserting only one bullet, spinning the chambers, pointing it at his head and pulling the trigger. And when there was just a click, he was overwhelmed by a feeling of delight and a sense of the meaningfulness of life. At a later stage, I discovered that a mild peak experience could be induced merely by concentrating hard on a pencil. You focus on the pencil, concentrate until you see nothing but the pencil, and then relax the attention until you see the whole room around it. Then concentrate again, concentrating as if your life depended on it. Then relax again. And you'll find that if you're doing this with the right degree of concentration, an effort deliberately ignoring the fatigue, you begin to get a feeling of strain behind your eyes. And when you experience that, push on, because then you are close to the peak experience. Keep going, and quite suddenly it dissolves into the peak experience. Concentration has the effect of summoning energy from your depths. It's a kind of pumping motion of expanding and contracting the attention that causes the peak experience. Another interesting point arose when I was lecturing in Maslow's class at Brandeis University in early 1967. I was speaking about the peculiar power of the human imagination. I can imagine trapping my thumb in the door and I can wince as if I'd actually done it. I can go to see a film and I can come out of the cinema feeling as if I'd been on a long journey. But even so, it must be admitted that imagination only provides a dim carbon copy of the original experience. I may try to recall a particularly happy day, for example, or even re-experience some of its pleasures, but compared to the original experience, it's like paste jewellery compared to the real thing. The hero of Babius's novel, Hell, trying to recall the experience of watching a woman undress, admits, these words are all dead. They leave untouched, powerless to affect it, the intensity of what was. But Proust, tasting a madeleine dipped in tea, recalls with sudden intensity the reality of his childhood. But that, unfortunately, is a fluke. He can't do it by any ordinary act of imagination. Yet, in the matter of sex, there appears to be an exception to this rule. A man can conjure up some imaginary scene with a girl undressing and responds physically as if there were a girl undressing in the room. That is, his imagination can even carry him to the point of a sexual climax. In this one case, man has completely surpassed the animals. Here is a case where the mental act no longer needs an object. Well, at this point, Maslow interrupted me to point out that this is not quite true. Monkeys often masturbate. I asked him if he'd ever seen a monkey masturbating in total isolation, without the stimulus of a female monkey anywhere in the vicinity. He thought for a moment, then said he hadn't. Even if he had, it wouldn't basically have affected my point. If monkeys can do problems for fun, as Maslow said they could, perhaps they have more imagination than we give them credit for. But... The interesting point is that in the matter of sex, man can achieve repeatedly what Proust achieved momentarily, testing the Madeleine. A physical response as if to reality. Absurd as it sounds, masturbation is one of the highest faculties mankind has yet achieved. But its importance is in what it presages, that one day the imagination will be able to achieve this result in all fields. If all perception is intentional, 
due to a kind of reaching out, of focusing on the part of the perceiver, then it ought to be possible to reconstruct any reality by making the necessary effort of focusing. We've only been kept from this recognition by the old false theory of passive perception. Anyone who did chemistry at school will recall what happens if you mix sulfur and iron filings and then heat them in a crucible. A small area of the sulfur melts and fuses with the iron. And at that point, you can remove the flame of the Bunsen burner and the reaction will continue of its own accord. The glow slowly spreads throughout the mixture until the whole crucible is red hot and the end result is a chunk of iron sulfide. The same process goes on in the mind when we become deeply interested in anything. The warm glow produced by favourite poetry or music is often the beginning of this fusing process. We're all familiar with the process of a wider glimpse of meaning leading to the revitalising of the will. This, in fact, is why people need holidays. As life drags on repetitively, they get tired and stop making effort. It's the will that gets run down. The holiday reminds them of wider meanings, reminds them of a universe that's a vast spiderweb of meaning stretching infinitely in all directions. And quite suddenly, they're enjoying everything more, eating, reading, walking, listening to music, having a beer before dinner. The meaning sharpens the appetite for life, that is, the will to live. It's our misfortune that we're not equally familiar with the reverse process, that a deliberate increase in willed concentration can also stop that fusion process working. This is, in fact, common sense. The deeper my sense of the meaningfulness of the world, the fiercer and more persistent my will. And increased efforts of will lead, in turn, to increased sense of meaning. It's a chain reaction. So, so is the reverse, when discouragement leads me to stop willing, and the passivity leads to a narrowed sense of meaning and a gradual loss of meaning, leading to further relaxation of the will. The result's a kind of down staircase of apathy. On the other hand, any intense glimpse of meaning can cause a transfer to the up staircase. This is most strikingly illustrated in an experiment that Maslow's colleague, Dr. Hoffer, carried out with alcoholics. Hoffer reasoned that alcoholics may be people of more than average intelligence and sensitivity, and because of this, they find that life's too much for them, and they drink because, at first, it produces peak experiences. But as often as not, it doesn't. Then they drink more to increase the stimulus and become involved in guilt and depression. And Hoffer tried giving these alcoholics mescaline, producing a far more powerful lift than alcohol, and then deliberately induced peak experiences by means of music, poetry, painting, whatever used to produce peak experiences before the person became an alcoholic. The startling result was that more than 50% were cured. The peak experience is an explosion of meaning, and meaning arouses the will, which in turn reaches out towards further horizons of meaning. The alcoholic drinks because he wants peak experiences, but he is in fact running away from them as fast as he can go. Once his sense of direction has been restored, he ceases to be an alcoholic, recognizing that peak experiences are in direct proportion to the intensity of the will. And what should be quite clear is that there's no theoretical limit to this chain reaction. Why does a man get depressed? Because at a certain point, he feels that a certain difficulty is not worth the effort. As he becomes more discouraged, molehills turn into mountains until, as William James says, life turns into one tissue of impossibilities and the process called nervous breakdown begins. Having recognised that the cause of the trouble lies in the collapse of the will, there is no theoretical reason why the ex-alcoholic should come to an end with the achievement of normality. There is, of course, a practical reason. The will needs a purpose. Why do we feel so cheerful when we're packing for a holiday, looking at maps, working out what to pack? Because we have long-distance purpose. One can understand how Balzac must have felt when he first conceived the idea of creating the comedy humaine, the idea of working out a series of novels about military life, a series about provincial life, a series about the aristocracy and so on, building castles in the air, this is called, but with a little effort they actually do get built. Man seems to need long-range purpose to get the best out of himself, and once the alcoholics achieve normality again, he may well say, all right, where do I go from here?
If this were true, it would represent a kind of dead end, for undoubtedly our civilization tends to deprive us of that kind of long-range purpose that our pioneer ancestors must have enjoyed. But it provides us with something else, the ability to live on the plane of the mind, the imagination. And there's a still more important matter that we've overlooked, the mind's capacity to reach out for meaning. This is perfectly illustrated by a story told in Roman Gary's novel, The Roots of Heaven. In a German concentration camp during the war, the French prisoners are becoming increasingly demoralised. They're on a down staircase. A man called Robert devises a way to arrest the decline. He suggests that they imagine an invisible girl in the billet, and if one of them swears or farts, he must bow and apologise to the girl. When they undress, they must hang up a blanket so she can't see them. Oddly enough, this absurd game works. They enter into the spirit of the thing and morale suddenly rises. The Germans become suspicious of the men and by eavesdropping they find out about the invisible girl. Well, the commandant fa fancies himself as a psychologist. He goes along to the billet with two guards and tells the men, I know you have a girl here, that is forbidden. Tomorrow I shall come here with these guards and you will hand her over to me. She'll be taken to the local brothel for German officers. Well, when he's gone, the men are dismayed. They know that if they hand her over, they won't be able to recreate her. The next day, the commandant appears with these two soldiers. Robert, as the spokesman said, we've decided not to hand her over. And the commandant knows he's beaten. Nothing he can do can force them to hand her over. Well, Robert's arrested and placed in solitary confinement, and they all think they've seen the last of him, but weeks later, he reappears very thin and worn. He explains that he's found the way to resist solitary confinement. The game with the invisible girl has taught him that the imagination is the power to reach out to other realities, realities not physically present. He's kept himself from breakdown by imagining great herds of elephants trampling over endless plains. The irony in the novel is that it's Robert who later becomes a hunter of elephants, but that's beside the point. The point is that the will can make an act of reaching out towards meaning, towards other realities. In phenomenological terms, what actually happened when the prisoners began apologising to the imaginary girl? First of all, they threw off their apathy and entered into a communal game. It was like a coat load of football fans whiling away a tedious journey with community singing. But having raised their spirits by entering into the game, they also reminded themselves of circumstances in which they'd normally be at their best. Gorky's story, 26 men and a girl, may be regarded as a parable about the same thing. The 26 overworked bakers keep up their spirits by idealising the girl, treating her as a kind of goddess, and thereby reminding themselves of the response appropriate to a goddess. And this leads naturally to a concept that's become the core of my own existential psychology the self-image. A man couldn't climb a vertical cliff without cutting handholds in the rock. Similarly, I can't achieve a state of intenser consciousness merely by wanting to. At least it's extremely difficult without training. We tend to climb towards higher states of self-awareness by a series of self-images. We create a certain imaginary image of the sort of person we'd like to be and then try to live up to that image. Um, the great man is the play-actor of his own ideal, says Nietzsche. One of the clearest expositions of the self-image idea can be found in a story called The Looking Glass by the Brazilian novelist Macado de Assis. A young man who's lived all his life in a small village in Brazil is called up for military service. In due course, he becomes a lieutenant. When he returns home in his uniform, he's the envy of the village, and his mother calls him My Lieutenant. One of his aunts is particularly delighted with him and she invites him to her remote farm and insists on addressing him as Senior Lieutenant. A brother-in-law and all the slaves follow suit. At first the youth's rather embarrassed. He doesn't feel like a lieutenant. But gradually he gets used to the idea. He says, the petting, the attention, the deference produced a transformation in me. He begins to feel like a lieutenant. But one day, the aunt goes away to the bedside of a sick daughter and takes away the brother-in-law with her. The lieutenant's left alone with the slaves. The next morning, they've all deserted, leaving him alone. Suddenly, there's no one to feed his ego. He feels lost. 
In his room, there's an enormous mirror placed there by his aunt. One day he looks in the mirror and his outline seems blurred and confused. A sense of unreality increases until he's afraid he's going insane. Then he has an inspiration. He takes his lieutenant's uniform from the wardrobe and puts it on. And immediately his image in the mirror becomes solid and clear. And his feeling of sanity and self-respect return. Every day thereafter, he puts on the uniform and sits in front of the mirror, and he's able to stay sane through the remaining weeks before his aunt returns. Mercado subtitles his story, Rough Draft of a New Theory of the Human Soul. And so it is, for a story written in 1882. His hero explains to his auditors that he believes that man has two souls, one inside looking out and the other outside looking in. But this is crude psychology. He means that the subjective I gains its sense of identity from actions and outward objects. But this implies that the inner me remains unchanged. And this, in turn, implies that the shy, nervous inner self is the kind of permanent substratum of one's more confident layers of personality. And this is obviously untrue. Shyness is simply a disinclination to express oneself out of a fear that it'll turn out badly. Confidence, such as he's gained through all that petting and admiration, is the ability to act decisively. The key sentence is, the petting, the attention, the deference produced a transformation in me. For this type of transformation, I coined the word promotion. It is, in effect, a promotion of the personality to a higher level. All poetic experience is a promotion experience since it raises the personality to a higher level. One has a sense of becoming a stronger or more mature or more competent or more serious person. If he'd been a lieutenant for several years, being alone in the house wouldn't have eroded his sense of identity. The trouble is that he was young and he was only just trying on a new personality, the senior lieutenant. The image of himself in the looking glass provides the reinforcement that he needed. The resemblance between this story and the Roman Gary story of the prison camp need hardly be pointed out. In both cases, moral decline is arrested by reminding oneself of something that recreates the self-image. The weakness of Mercado's theory of two souls becomes clear when we consider that Robert keeps himself sane in solitary confinement by an effort of inner strength, of imagination, not by evoking a more successful level of his personality. The elephants are an image of freedom. The sensation of freedom is always accompanied by a feeling of contraction of one's inner being. Such a contraction occurs when we concentrate intently upon anything. It also occurs in sexual excitement and explains why the orgasm is perhaps the most fundamental, or at least the most common, promotion experience. The self-image notion is of immediate relevance to Maslow's psychology, and here we touch upon the very heart of the matter, the most important point of all. Let's consider the question, what is the mechanism by which a self-image produces promotion? The answer is, it provides me with a kind of artificial standard of objective values. It gives me a sense of external meaning. Why did the peak experience under mescaline cure the alcoholics? Because the peak experience is a flood of meaning, obviously pouring in from outside. As it pours in, you ask yourself the question, why doesn't this happen all the time if the meaning's always there? The answer's obvious, because I allow the will to become passive and the senses close up. If I want more meaning, then I must force my senses wide open by an increased effort of will. We might think of the senses as spring-loaded shutters that must be forced open and which close again when you let them. It must be clearly understood that we live in a kind of room of subjective emotions and values. If I'm not very careful, the shutters close and I lose my objective standards. At this point, I'm, I may wildly exaggerate the importance of my emotions, my private ups and downs, and there's no feeling of objective reality to contradict me. A child beset by misery is more bewildered than an adult because he has nothing to measure it by. He doesn't know how serious it is. As soon as his mother kisses him and says, there, it doesn't really matter, he relaxes. If I get myself into a state about some trivial worry, and then I hear that some old friend has died of cancer, I instantly snap out of my black mood, for my emotions are cut down to their proper size by comparison with a more serious reality.
Moods and emotions are a kind of fever produced by a lack of contact with reality. The shutters are closed and the temperature in the room rises. It can rise to a degree where it can become a serious fever, where the emotions have got so out of control that reality cannot break in. These are states of psychotic delusion, or perhaps merely of nervous overstrain. The characteristic of these states is exaggeration. Every minor worry turns into a monstrous bogey. Inevitably, I cease to make efforts of will, for the will is at its healthiest when I have a firm sense of reality and a purpose. And we've seen what happens when the will becomes passive. The vital forces sink, and at a certain point, physical health is affected. The existential psychologist, Viktor Frankl, remarked on how close is the connection between a man's state of mind, his courage and hope, or lack of it, and the state of immunity of his body. And he tells a story that makes this point forcefully. Frankl was a Jew who'd spent most of the war in a German concentration camp, and he says, I once had a dramatic demonstration of the close link between the loss of faith in the future and this dangerous giving up. F, my senior block warden, a fairly well-known composer and librettist, confided in me one day, I would like to tell you something, Doctor. I've had a strange dream. A voice told me that I could wish for something and that I should only say what I wanted to know and all my questions would be answered. Well, what do you think I asked? That I'd like to know when the war would be over. You know what I mean, Doctor. For me, I wanted to know when we, our camp, would be liberated and our sufferings would come to an end. And when did you have this dream, I asked. In February 1945, he answered. It was the, then the beginning of March. And what did your dream voice answer? Furtively, he whispered, March 30th. When F told me about his dream, he was still full of hope and convinced that the voice of his dream would be right. But as the promised day drew nearer, the war news which reached our camp made it appear very unlikely that we'd be free on the promised date. On March the 29th, F suddenly became very ill and ran a high temperature. On March 30th, the day's prophecy had told him the war and suffering would be over for him, he became delirious and lost consciousness. On March 31st, he was dead. To all outward appearances, he died of typhus. Frankel's composer friend was physically near the end of his resources. That's why the collapse of his will made such a difference. Frankel also mentions the unprecedentedly high death rate in the camp between Christmas 1944 and New Year 1945 because so many prisoners had pinned their hope on being home for Christmas. It took a year of work in the chewing gum factory to deplete Maslow's gold patient to the point where she ceased to menstruate. Normally healthy people possess a kind of cushion of energy to absorb shocks and disappointments. And this cushion is identical to the surplus energy tanks of which we've spoken. It is maintained by willpower fired by a sense of meaning. We are only aware of this direct action of the will upon the body in physical extremes. For example, if I'm feeling sick, I can disperse this sickness by snapping out of my feeling of nausea and summoning subconscious forces of health. If we were more clearly aware of this connection between positive consciousness and physical health, we treat mental passivity as a form of illness. Another anecdote of Frankel's from the same book may be said to provide the foundation of an attitude psychology closely related to Maslow's. The prisoners were transferred from Auschwitz to Dachau. The journey took two days and three nights, during which time they were packed so tight that few of them could sit down and they were half starved. At Dachau, they had to stand in line all night and throughout the next morning in freezing rain as a punishment because one man had fallen asleep and missed the roll call. Yet, they were all immensely happy and laughing and making jokes because Dachau had no incinerator chimney. To summarise, man evolves through a sense of external meaning. When his sense of meaning is strong, he maintains a high level of will drive and of general health. Without this sense of external meaning, he becomes the victim of subjective emotions, a kind of dream that tends to degenerate into nightmare. His uncontrolled fantasies and worries turn into an octopus that strangles him. Man's evolved various ways of preventing this from happening. The most important of these is religion. This tells a man that certain objective standards are permanently true and that his own nature is weak and sinful. The chief trouble with authoritarian religion is that it works best for intellectually uncomplicated people 
and fails to carry much conviction for the highly sophisticated and neurotic, who are the very ones who need it most. In certain respects, art succeeds where religion fails. A great symphony or poem is an active reminder of the reality of meaning. It provides a stimulus like an electric shock, reanimating the will and the appetite for life. Its disadvantage is that we all assume that art is subjective by nature, and that it tells us about the emotions of the artist, not about the objective world. And so when life fails, the effectiveness of art diminishes. Men of imagination have always tended to use the self-image method to prevent them from becoming victims of this octopus of subjectivity. It's essentially a method for pushing problems and disappointments to arm's length. Yeats has described how, when he was sure no one was looking, he used to walk about London with the peculiar strut of Henry Irving's Hamlet. In Heartbreak House, Hector wiles away an idle moment by pretending to fight a duel with an imaginary antagonist, then making love to an imaginary woman. But the self-image also plays a central role in all human creativity. The young artist, lacking certainty about his own identity, projects a mental image of himself that blurs into an image of the artist he most admires. Brahms' self-image is half Beethoven, Yeats's is half Shelley. And the ultimate value of their work, its inner consistency and strength, depends upon how deeply they commit themselves to acting out the self-image. According to Freud and Karl Marx, fantasy is an escape from reality and responsibility. According to Maslow, fantasy is the means by which a determined man masters reality. Reality is the key word in existential psychology. It poses no philosophical problems, it simply means objective meaning as opposed to subjective values. Eliot wrote, we each think of the key, each in his prison, implying that there's no escape from one subjective prison. But Blake knew better. He agreed that five windows like the caverned man, but added that through one of them he can pass out whenever he wants to. That is to say that by an effort of reaching out to meaning, he can establish contact with reality. The situation could be compared to a child who's become confused during a game of blind man's buff, but who has only to remove the bandage in order to reorient himself to the room. And the most important point for psychotherapy is that he can do this by an act of will. Mental illness is a kind of amnesia in which the patient has forgotten his own powers. The task of the therapist is somehow to renew the patient's contact with reality.